All right, everyone. Welcome to the STOA. Um, today's session is called Collective Intelligence, uh, a view from the existential trenches. And our good friend John Thompson from Circling Europe is back here at the, the STOA. Uh, and John is one of the central figures of the Circling movement. I was talking to John uh, about a month ago saying, what's something you'd like to do at the STOA? And he's been uh, experimenting with a lot of cool things there over at Europe uh, with circling and kind of collective intelligence. Uh, and today is gonna to be one of those experiments. Um, so I'm quite happy. It's going to be a 90 minute session. It's gonna be uh, uh, interactive. Um, so if you don't wanna participate, perhaps it's uh, best to slip out now, uh, but everyone can turn on their camera, let there be light in the STOA. This will be recorded, um, but we'll only post certain portions of it. Uh, so. Uh, uh, if you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that to me or message me afterwards and I won't uh, include you. Um, but that being said, I'm going to hand over uh, the keys to the STOA to John now, uh, give him host access, and you'll be in his hands for the next 90 minutes. Uh, so, John, welcome back to the STOA, my friend. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, I, I would say I'm, I'm happy to share this. And I'm also kind of um, terrified, I would say, because of this, this talking about this theme, it's so kind of wrapped up with paradox. Um, and yeah, basically, I, I find it super hard to talk about. And I very rarely do talk about it. But I love to um, practice together and share share practices that link to collective intelligence. I, I co-founded Circling Europe about nine years ago and pretty much have spent the last nine years leading transformational workshops all around the world, kind of every other weekend pretty much for nine years. So it's that's the kind of existential trenches that I've found myself in of like leading this cutting edge practice that's super interesting and transformative and getting to play with it and tweak it and like experiment with it. And I think it was about two or three years in when we started to experience what we just started to name as collective intelligence. It was like, we'd never really studied collective intelligence or talked about it, but it was like the group would just start to become intelligent. And, you know, at its best, it would just be kind of syn synchronicities happening and like one person needs something and the other person's already on their way to give them the thing that they need. and. We were just like, wow, collective intelligence, like how did this happen? And we were a part of it as well, even though we were facilitating, like it was working on us too. And it seemed like circling seems to generate coherence, you could say. And it seems like collective intelligence is like an epiphenomena of of coherence. That's quite technical, but that's like how I would see it. And then just in the last couple of years, I've thought, so we, we started off circling and then surrendered leadership emerged in a workshop when we were doing a lot of circling. And it, that was like this more like surrendering to a group presence um, trusting in emergence, like trusting in where the aliveness would want to go in the group. And that led to this, that seemed to lead to this collective intelligence. And then just in the last few years, especially as I've heard people talking about collective intelligence a lot more, and um, it's like I've started to lead workshops that head it on a little bit more directly. And that's been that's been super cool actually, because, so there was the context of circling, 
And then there's a context of surrendered leadership, which was that little bit more surrendering into the mystery and letting go as leaders into what could happen, but it was built on top of circling. And then now when I lead these collective intelligence experiments, it feels like an even deeper letting go. Because when, when these 12 people or however many like arrive on the screen in this experiment, it's like the way I'm looking at it is that there's already collective intelligence starting to work. So like even, so now as I look at you guys, it's like, I, yeah, I do have a sense of like collective intelligence is starting to, is, is here. And then, and from this place, I'm kind of trapped in a paradox in my leadership in terms of like, ah, oh, we can create this environment for collective intelligence by getting coherence, um, by doing circling practices that improve that. And we can gather as a group and like have this sense of we, and then from this place, we can put something in to bring our intelligence to. So that's like the, what seems like the formal side of things. It's like, yeah, we can, hey, we can gather and do this thing. And then there's this other truth that I feel kind of trapped with the whole time of like, well, it's actually already happening. So then I find myself in the sandwich in between those two things, and then we just go for it together. And it's been, um, yes, yeah, felt like a new form has emerged in the work that we do. And it's, uh, it feels like more efficient somehow and more rich and more, I don't know if scalable is the word, but it's like, it feels like a new emergence that I'm intrigued by. And also feel like a total beginner with it somehow, or like, it feels like a real experiment of a, um, early kind. But there's, there's something about like that, that listening for it, like, is it here? What, what is it? And that, that kind of trust that it's, it's, it's here. And from a, from a leadership point of view, it's, it's like, can I, can I see it? Can I find it? I'm like, it's not somewhere to get to. And then I ha also have a sense that in, in being able to hold that perspective, it's kind of, it enacts in some way, like obviously it doesn't create reality entirely, but there's an, an enactive quality to it. And there's a real uh, surrender to, to life that's moving through us. And I think that's what my trust has been built in from seeing, from being in the, these trenches in the workshops of like, life recognizes life and life wants to sustain life and life as a collective wants to flourish. So in, in terms of holding a space for collective intelligence, it's like, it's listening for that. And I, I welcome your, your contributions and your intelligence, like from now, now onwards as well.
I can speak. The paradox that you're talking about, John. It, it just came to me that the paradox is that I might come to this collective intelligence and wanting somehow to use it for a tool. I want to use it, right? So when you said, you know, like bring something here that we could then, that the collective intelligence could somehow solve or make happen or push ahead. But it's that idea of using it. It's very interesting. And so I am feeling that paradox. That's a particular framing, you know, as opposed to what's already here, which is more of a listening. I mean, and you keep saying that. And it's like, I can feel that contrast in me. Wait a minute, you know, I'm, I'm here to do something, right? To make some outcome happen, or we're here to make something happen. Well, or solve something or whatever, you know, whatever. And the already here, which takes me back to listening. And took me back to the intention. You know, what's the intention, this gathered intention of everyone that's just come here, feeling into that. My offering. Yeah, gathering to bring collective intelligence to something presupposes a certain kind of knowing about reality. And, and I think that's beautiful. And I include that in what I do with collective intelligence. And there's something of like, what can come out of the unknown that is really humbling and like, allows for a broadening of what intelligence actually is and what it can be together. As the, as the space was just filling up with silence, I, um, I could feel like a word building up in, in Peter's mind and on the tip of his tongue. And it's that word he uses so often of delicious. There's just a delicious silence in the middle, sort of like expanding with every second. And uh, I was waiting for someone to take a bite out of it. And uh, I had uh, Nancy's face pop in mind for a second. And she was at like the bottom of my screen. And then I closed my eyes and then I had Danny's face pop into my mind. And then Danny's voice popped up and she was in the spot where Nancy was. And this is my first time circling. So I don't know if I'm doing it right, but I, I figured it was my turn to take a bite out of that, out of that delicious silence. And now I'm gonna put it back.
Uh, I'm going to take a, a you know try at this. Uh, a lot of times I uh, start um, sharing and doesn't come out exactly the way I wanted it to. But I I listened to Danny and and um, to Zach and like you know the delicious silence that we we have been in and it's and it's it is delicious. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, like Danny said, using this, using um, this collective intelligence to to go forward where, where we want to go. Um, I I'm wondering if we need to pose a question or I, I'm not sure. It it just seems it's it's. Uh, I can stay in that delicious silence forever. It's wonderful. <laughs> and especially with a group, it's just, mm, you know, and you, we really feel each other and we're together. Um, but to be able to uh, speak in a collective, uh, I, I'd like to see how that works, you know, how it, it works and, and moving forward. One thing that's coming up, um, sort of tied to the, the delicious thing that uh, Zach was mentioning, because um, I felt it too when the silence uh, was here. Um, it's like, you know, those magic eye photos where there's like a, you just stare at something and then like a 3D image pops out uh, and then you, you look away. It's like, that kind of energy happens when I'm in these spaces and when the silence is here, just something pops up I'm like, oh, okay, it just feels thick and I'm in it. Um, and like, what is that? How do I get into right relationship with this thing? Um, so that's the question that's has emerged for me. Oh, this is Tom here. This uh, reminds me so much of a Quaker meeting. I was brought up as a Quaker and went to uh, Quaker meetings every Sunday morning from the time I was very small to, I don't know, my early teens. Uh, I wouldn't describe myself as a Quaker now. <clears throat> I found it quite secular in my views. But the for, for those that don't know, Quaker meeting is one hour of uh, everyone sitting around in silence. And uh, Quakers don't have a, a pastor or uh, a hierarchy and structure, but uh, everyone sits in silence until someone feels moved to speak, to use the, sort of the terminology of Quakers. And and they say what's on their mind. And, and then there are other periods of silence. And it, it could be that you sit through 45 or 50 minutes of complete silence or even a whole hour of silence. But at other times, uh, other people are sort of pick up on the vibe and, and uh, choose to speak about right. something. Sorry about that noise. And, uh, the, the, the terminology that people use is sort of, you know, connecting to God. Uh, and uh, I, I presume that there's some sort of more basic psychological explanations that uh, have some similarity to when people collectively do things that are uh, satisfying, whether it's listening to music or playing tennis or uh, reciting poetry or, or whatever. There's a, a deep feeling of um, uh, connectedness and satisfaction when when people um, 
are, are just extraordinarily sensitive to their own feelings, but uh, to everyone else's. And, uh, and, and I suppose in today's day and age, we don't experience that too often because we're always, you know, wanting to express something or say something or send a photo. Uh, we've, we've always, we're, we're always trying to get something done or, or, or uh, express ourselves, you know, to our own satisfaction or, or, or sort of climb a hierarchy of some sort. And, uh, and, and I, and I think that, that there's, um, such a need for people, particularly young people, to feel appreciated for just who they are uh, uh, in, in a non-performative way. So this is, this is cool because it brings back some of those, those memories uh, of, of, of sitting in a, a Quaker meeting, where I frankly would quite often uh, pick up a book and read because uh, I, I, I didn't really appreciate um, the sort of meditative aspects at that point in my life. Thank you. It feels like we are this big balloon and we are poking the holes in this pockets of presence. And I wonder when this balloon will burst and how many pockets has to have to be poked in order for it to burst. So I have this feeling that it's kind of the tempo speeds up a little bit and it's almost like one pocket, one that the, the pulses between the, the pokes are getting smaller and I'm anticipating when it's gonna like poof. And then something happens. I have this feeling of emergence. It's funny. I'm during the silence. I find myself wanting to jump out of my skin, um, but I find it fascinating and lovely, and it makes me curious that. That other people have, have responded to it by by finding it so delicious, and I I wonder if it's something about a rhythm that I'm not quite able to tap into yet. Um, something about like being able to feel into you know classical music if you're used to rock music. It's probably not the best metaphor, but it's what it's making me think of, and I'm. I'm, I'm wondering about it almost like neurologically or, or rhythmically. Um, there's like a, a pulse, I guess, that maybe other people are able to feel into. And for whatever reason, conversationally, I haven't quite experienced that. So I'm I, uncomfortable and curious. Also, John, I really like your kitchen. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm reminded. Oh, you want to go next? <laughs> sure, just a little inkling. Um, I I feel upset with with certain aspects of behavior in my life, and that is the performative, having to be asked to go on stage and not be ready, um, or to be put in a spot where 
I'm uncomfortable to do a performance because I'm un unprepared. Um, and then the other thing is the constraints of believing who we are and how we should wear a certain hat um, when we show up to a group. Um, and of course I've worn, worn many hats. Um, so I've been in circumstances where I've been known as a musician when I'm not a musician. I didn't show up as a musician, but there was no other musician available. Um, so suddenly I was in the position of being a musician without even knowing that that was a capability. Um, so I think what the circling al allows is this voice to the unworn hat, the, the, the idea that we don't have to be who we are labeled to be um, and, who we, and, and what we label ourselves to be. Um, so I think that's, for me, it's, that's what the collective is, is to understand that these labels in life are pretty much irrelevant um, to our soul ambition. Anyway, that's my piece. <laughs> mm. All right, that, I got something totally else that just came up with that, is that scene in the, the second season of The Leftovers where he opens up the wardrobe and he sees the four different outfits. And there's a note on the front that says, know who you are and adorn yourself accordingly. What hat do you want to wear? What top do you want to put on? What dance do you want to perform? Or what is needed? So what do you want to put on, Zach? You know, I'm trying to decide between the uh, the jester's cap and the mm -hmm. king's crown, and uh, both both have their uh, their appeal. But those are those are the two I'm trying to decide between Thor and Loki. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm asked. Yeah. It's interesting as we're talking about roles. I think that does have something to do with the anxiety of all this for me, like sort of this panicky feeling of like a, a pressure to perform, uh, sort of a feeling like I'm somehow failing in my responsibility to the group or collective to keep the conversation going or to play a particular role. Um, so yeah, that was an, uh, I appreciate you both pointing that out and the potential possibly for freedom from that, if it keeps going. I'm wondering how much my unconscious is being played out in the space. I'm like, I'm having these wry smiles, hearing people say things of like, oh, that sounds a bit like me and how I am here. And that's a frequent experience in my leading of like, oh, here's my psyche in front of me. And yet it's not just about me. <laughs> like that's real for them. And I'm a character in their thing too. John, do you ever get scared from this yeah. in, within in the midst of this experience? If so, how does it feel like? I actually feel less fear when I do collective intelligence experiments because it feels like it's less on me somehow to 
hold the context of circling or surrender leadership. It's like, I'm just one piece of the collective intelligence. So it's quite relaxing. And I, I feel deeply held by something because of how much grace I get to experience through doing these things. Like it, it does feel experimental and creating conditions and then grace keeps happening. So I just feel so fulfilled and I keep going. And that's one view. I also have all my ego stuff that comes with it. That <laughs> I wanted to introduce my, my feline friend who apparently really wants to join. Uh, her name is Gracie. So Grace has been bidden to this circle and she has responded. And she doesn't want to leave just yet. Um, John, I'm wondering, I, I have never been in, you know, circling or collective intelligence in person. <laughs> so I'm wondering when you have a circle a real circle with real people, you know, like sitting together in their bodies, uh, you know, how do you usually start it off? Uh, like, I'm wondering if there is community building or just let's go from here. It depends on the context of the gathering. And within that, there's, there's, a, there's a letting go with me every time. So I'll have a plan, I'll have a structure, if that will be followed or not, um, because I'm always listening. So yeah, even with some beginners groups with people, yeah, it's, it can be very much like this. And that can lead to a lot of dynamic things happening. And other times it can look a lot more formal and like, yeah, we're gonna do this practice and this, this principle and, um, but for, for a collective intelligence experiment, which isn't actually circling, it's, then, then it's just that context. And then in that way, I would, I would be following what I've kind of shared so far of like this, this, this listening so on one side, I'm just listening and, and I'm in it with you. And on the other side, I'm like, are we, are we ready to put something in? Like, oh, are we, are we ready to put something in to bring collective intelligence to like part of me, like feels like in sense when we're, when there's a we space. And then part of me is like, well, there's always a we space. Turtles all the way down. That's what I always go. I um, the word that keeps coming to mind for me is murmuration. Um, like a you know a flock of birds or fish how they how they they rhythm together and move together um and i'm thinking of us as humans and thinking of you know the history of collective humanity and our evolution away from tribal bonding and and living in tribal rhythms um and thinking about this as, as sort of a process of maybe switching on whatever that was in our, our, our brains or our nervous systems again. Um, and I'm wondering about it as a process. Like, do, do you find that it's a process that groups have to go through? Is it something that builds over time? Is it a muscle that needs to be built? And obviously I'm sure, you know, coming to it just 
based on what's happening today, some people are naturally more muscular in it than others. When you mention murmurations of uh, birds, it, it brings to mind something that I've come to uh, believe through my uh, re research into neurophysiology and evolutionary biology and so on, which um, <clears throat> which I love. Uh, and, and, and one of the facts that I, I think that we tend to overlook, um, well, one of the discoveries over the last 15, 20 years is the, the incredible uh, deep homology between the genetics of humans and, and, and animals. So historically, we've imagined that human beings are so completely different from primates and, and, and other mammals and, and certainly different from reptiles and fish and so on. But once you actually look at genes and how they're expressed, uh, you, you realize that for over 500 million years, pro probably close to a billion years, there have been remarkable consistencies, which means that th the, the focus we have had on sort of words as a form of communication is probably overstated. And, and so much of how we communicate is subliminal. We're extraordinarily sensitive to where other people are looking and, and how they're behaving. And, and so the differences between humans, let's say, and, and dogs um, it, it is far less than we imagine. And when you look at a dog interacting with other dogs or with humans, they're, they're extremely sensitive to every single movement. And, and I think we are as well and, and in a situation like this sort of it it tamps down the words and, and we become uh, more sensitive to people's uh, sort of subliminal ways of communicating you know our body language the tone of our voice um sort of you know how we look at each other and and i and I think there is so much to be gained from not talking, but richly communicating. Uh, and, I, and, and my sense is that one of the reasons people love dogs and fall in love with pets and cats is because they realize that the, the, the richness of the communication is, is um, unfathomable. And, and of course, dogs and cats don't talk. This may made me think of, uh, there's a lot of emphasis in uh, psychological research, neurological research on, on co-regulation. Um, amongst humans about the importance of, you know, parent to child co-regulation, mirror neurons, et cetera. Um, co-regulation of the nervous system. Seaburn Fisher has talked a lot about that um, in her research on neurofeedback and her work in neurofeedback. But I, I haven't seen anything about collective co-regulation, group co-regulation, tribal co-regulation. Yeah, there's, potential for that to be a beautiful thing, I think. But I think, yeah, as, as, sorry, now I'm talking a bunch, so I've got all these ideas. Um, uh, a lot of us are probably pretty wounded in that way by you know, the emphasis on individualism, collectivism, how are you doing? And, and 
and the emphasis in a way of, of contribution. You know, what are you contributing? What are you accomplishing? What are you creating? Um, and this is such a, a flip from that. It's such a, you have to feel into a different way of being. It has to be not okay. You have to be able to feel into the net of people, <laughs> the knots that are carrying all the other knots. Rebecca, I noticed myself smiling when you use the term collective co-regulation. I got excited about that concept. And then I says to myself, probably smiling on a screen like this when somebody's talking serves to co-regulate somewhat. So I'm appreciating you right now, Rebecca. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wear my Loki hat a little bit and I'm smiling because I am thinking of something that Rebecca said earlier about the cycles that brought up to me like the woman's menstrual cycle and how jealous I am that I can't sync my cycle to all of you who menstruate. Um, that's a way of collective co-regulation perhaps. Um, even before uh, Tom spoke, I was feeling myself in a kind of uh, primate mode and noticing, I was really noticing Lizelle grooming her hair and I was sort of like playing with my hair and I was really noticing postures and about hands and yeah there was it was interesting being able to just sit and notice and feel connected on a very physiological level somehow and I was also wondering like instead of a question like what other kind of focus could arise and I was thinking about like a prayer or a like an asking or a healing intention rather than a question yeah thank you I'm gonna go back a little bit to Nancy's wondering about in-person versus Zoom. And uh, I think lots of, there's a lot of playing around with, uh, I mean, none of us knew how to do Zoom probably a year ago or you know, 18 months ago. It's like, what? And I certainly feel many of us have been adapting you know there's a real this is a real adaptive consciousness and uh, that uh, what you call the the, the uh, regulation Thomas Hubel calls it a shared nervous system so meeting like this the opportunity is here I mean I can sit here and close my nervous system and I don't feel any of you. Or I can say, whoa, what would that mean? What would that be like if this was a, you know, it's, it's the old Indra's neck, but it's the nervous system that is open to be shared. Don't even know exactly what that is, but. So, we keep playing with Zoom. And one thing it gives me is so many faces up close. 
no matter where I am physically. Can you imagine if all of these faces were that close to you physically? It can't happen, right? I mean, we do lose the whole body. We lose, you know, the, what, what, the, what, you know what everybody's feet are doing right now, right? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but um, I, I am marveling at the capacity of our consciousness to um, learn, learn communicating. And I'd like to throw one, this goes back to Zach, when you said, you know, I don't know if you were referring to the hat, but just what's needed, what might be needed. And I notice for me, collective intelligence very often for me gets equated to cross pollination. That speaking over separation over silos, over memes, over whatever, but we're just here. And when you first, Rebecca, when you first offered in, oh, wait a minute, I wasn't that comfortable. I was feeling delicious. That can feel like that's a disruption in the field or in fact, it's an offering. It's a flavor into the field. And again, this is coming from me. This is Thomas Hubel. It's like realizing that each one of our approaches to this or our responses are creating this right now. And they're completely, and when, when they're not, when we decide they shouldn't be here, it kind of creates a little hole in the container, a little separation. Oh, well, I don't know what this is. And I'm just gonna, you know, I don't know what to do here. What a beautiful thing to be able to say, you know, I wanna say, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what this is. And it just shit, it kind of ripples through everyone. So it's that ripple. It's like, what's getting rippled? I have no idea of it. That's some, so I just want to end with the cross pollination matters a great deal to me. It is, it is where the, to me, the, the future of, of intelligence is. And I believe it's a learning. I believe it's not what we started with. I found myself. Uh, I found myself being extremely excited when you mentioned the word "the field," and Peter typed it as well. And oh, it feels to me there's something. There's something there in, in the concept of the field, um, because uh, yes, as primates, we we do have this ability to pick up on a lot of things unconsciously. But what's happening here, I'm asking myself, because usually I need to see someone's entire body and be with them physically in order to be able to pick up on what's playing between us. But here we're, we're people, 20, 20 people, and somehow we're still picking up on each other, even though we can only see each other's faces. So I have to ask myself, what the fuck? <laughs> and I, I love this. I, I love this. Yeah, to follow up on that, I um, 
I get the sense that, you know, we're plugging in here at this moment, but for many of us, we see each other across various contexts at the STOA, and then not only at the STOA, but on social media and in Clubhouse and other places. And so there's this immediate field that might happen now, but then there's this field that goes across time that, you know, just carries on. And, and we signal to each other unconsciously with the vocabulary we use, the way we say things, there's like this unconscious signal going on because we hang around each other so much. And that is kind of ongoing. That's the felt. That's my felt sense of, of this. Hearing that, Alex, I agree, and it makes me think of when I've done this kind of thing in contexts that aren't as shared. Like I remember when I've done stuff in business, and um, in particular, and like remembering how awkward and crunchy and messy um, these kind of things have got, and. Uh, And then often still feeling like I remember the first time in business, like I went through, I mean, I was ready to walk out for 45 minutes. Um, I ended up absolutely screaming to people because they just thought I was a hippie trying to uh, do something. <laughs> and that was the way to actually get them to see that that wasn't the case. And then it cracked and then there were tears and like, it was all about, oh yeah, I'm not working well on this because I didn't have a proper welcome when I arrived in the company. And like this hard ass businesswoman was just, I could just feel it's like, oh yeah, there's the human heart that's underneath. And um, and and I've got burnt over the years from being quite cavalier with this kind of approach and I've learned to tweak it and I've become way more trauma sensitive and that kind of thing. And I still have a, a real deep trust of what's, what can get enacted between people on the level of instinct and heart and love and truth. And that speaks a little to Brandon's comment as well of like, I just, yeah, I, I hear you. We're, we're at the top of the hour and I'm conscious of time, so I don't know if, uh, you know, I don't want to throw in more <laughs> Kindle on the fire if this is uh, shortly over, but um, I feel like at the Stoa, I've, there's like this constructed reality between us of like a game B world that's happening. And even though I don't speak like Daniel Schmachtenberger, I find myself already starting to think like him and Verveke and, and others. And that gives me certain types of ninja skills out in the world because I'm feel like I'm seeing more than regular people, but that also I feel disappointed in the regular world because people are not seeing what we are seeing, perhaps. And so I balance the, the ninja-ness of what I've picked up 
at Stoa with kind of the disappointment that things aren't progressing more quickly. Hence the need for leadership. And stewardship. You talked about dressing like a ninja and a ninja sort of disguises their, their identity a little bit, right? And you mentioned a couple of those folks that you feel like you're, you know, sort of taking on, you know, piece of their identity. So I'm going to throw out the one that's, that I'm hoping to, to take on and, and, and swim with a little bit um, and invite others to do as well. And that's, that's Zach Stein. I would love to embody some of those skills as a ninja in the school of Zachary Stein. Just a little depth uh, to what I was saying. Um, and I've, I've uh, spoken yet because I, I think I'm a better writer than a speaker. Um, but it, it seems related to the uh, thinking fast and thinking slow, the interpersonal relation. This, I think in, in integral theory, it's the lower left quadrant. It's the, uh, it is collective and it is interior. There's a, that dimension. But then within that, we can see that there's the system one and system two, the direct uh, in, interpersonal relation of, of, of intuition. And this is how we're, we're syncing up with each other in culturally in this space. But then the, you, there is a, uh, a thinking slow, which um, I know that uh, Tom Big Bang here recently had a, a session about how uh, that is so much overblown and that because it's so much of our, of our lives comes from this intuition, but that to be able to hone that skill as well, because it happens sometimes, this is what we re require in order to have inter to have, uh, to relate to people from other cultures who we don't interact with. So that's a, that's a skill that we do need to develop as well. And we're not developing it here because we're syncing up with each other culturally in this direct space. And there's uh, uh, entirely different skills we, we, we need to use to utilize to be able to relate to people who aren't going to be joining a solo session. I don't know if that made sense, but that's uh, something that uh, is worth exploring in the future. I feel like making a link between what you just said, Brandon and Sonia, that the, the channels that we use, the tools that we use to communicate, our hands, right, faces, bodies, nervous systems, mirror neurons, all of that, not just tone of voice or sounding, that may be interpreted differently between cultures, which can confuse us. But on the other hand, perhaps there's some, I believe there is, people study, there's some common, like the smile for one <laughs> that reaches across, so. You know, riffing off those two thoughts, I, I think that the matter of attention is so critical. And, you know, when Brandon was talking and he mentioned my name, I immediately poked up and <laughs> stopped looking at all my notifications. And, and I think that 
one of the problems with Zoom is that it's it's so difficult to um, sort of tear oneself away from everything that's going on on the screens. And uh, I, I think there's, there's so many benefits for getting together because when you get together, you can really tell whether someone's paying attention. Uh, when you're on Zoom, you're never quite sure. And, uh, and, and I think if there's sort of one way of communicating that is probably more significant than many, you know, apart from sort of signs of aggressiveness and, and anger, it, it's attention. And, and so when someone is not necessarily looking at you, but you can tell that they're listening, uh, that engenders sort of a, a sinking of minds and like a synchronization of minds rather than S-I-N-K-I-N-G. And, uh, and, 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 uh, I, I, th I think we need to find ways of uh, injecting that back into our lives, aside from this uh, sort of very, very occasional session on, on a Zoom call here, uh, which, which I'm, I'm finding uh, uh, exhilarating and, and enriching. So thank you. I um, I find myself uh, throughout this asking what's already here. I'm not actually sure if there's more to say, but uh, yeah, I'll leave really it at that. interesting as someone who feels pressured to talk um i was actually just really moved by and and you may actually feel embarrassed i'm pointing you out like this steven so i apologize but there was just the, that moment of silence and then you spoke for the first i think it was the first time in the meeting and you know it was something you'd been holding and it was like the silence sort of created a like a womb or like a, like a space for you, a, sort of a soft space for you to enter apart from, you know, what, <laughs> what is often in conversation, my chattering, because I feel pressure to fill the space. Um, but there is just something really beautiful that happened when created space for you to enter. So thank you. What's that pressure like, Rebecca? Like, I'm like, is it the same when you just spoke? When I just spoke, no, because I, I actually had something to say. <laughs> um, 
but when it's silent like this, it's, uh, yeah, it's like this sort of feeling of panic inwardly and a sense of I'm failing. Like, yeah, somehow like I'm failing everybody I should be speaking. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's odd, but that's what it feels like. Or maybe odd, not so odd, maybe other people feel that too. I have a headache, Rebecca. I also feel that I'm failing our collective intelligence with my migraine, so. <laughs> Oh, no, <laughs> you're not. <laughs> well, I'm bringing li life in it, so life not without the migraines, so in that sense. We balance it out, right, Rebecca? Plus, you have no idea what kind of power you might be contributing to the field with your headache. That may be, may be more than you know. Exactly, more Alice, yeah, exactly. That's, that's why I'm here, yeah. It's an experiment. I do find so Sonia's. I, I really sit and, and crave Sonia's um, monologues. They calm me down. They like you know make me move. And I'm like, okay, Sonia, tell us something. <laughs> I'm craving to hear your voice. Really, it's really it works soothing into for my migraine. So I appreciate that. <laughs> That's so sweet. It's funny because I often, very often when I talk, I feel like I disrupt, the, I disrupt myself. <laughs> it's quite uncomfortable for me to talk in public sometimes. And I often kind of get lost in the, I lose connection when I talk. So that's interesting feedback for me. Thank you. That's that actually helps a lot. Win-win, I think. I've noticed that I've had a lot of ideas of things I could say. Like my external intuition was like, oh, you could say this, you could say that. But then my internal feeling has just been like, yeah, but like, why? Like why? I feel no compulsion to speak up or say anything. So maybe not saying something, you know, leaves empty space for <laughs> others to step in or people to wrestle with their own anxieties. I don't know. Kevin, I have this playful feeling right now and I want to say, why not? You said, why would I speak? Why wouldn't you? That goes to me and to everyone probably. I found it so cute, Kevin, that you give the permission to to feel anxiety and you're like, oh, okay. Do I have some? Like, it's a, 
like you're giving everybody permission to feel anxious. I felt it. It's quite, quite nice. <laughs> you have my permission. I think I've, you know, I've sort of think about technology a lot, like 10 minutes ago, I was just staring at my camera for like, you know, five minutes or something. It's like, cause you can't really stare into someone's eyes here. It's like, but if you're in person, you can sort of know when someone's looking at you. Um, I think the part of like having to press the, having to unmute myself seems like a bigger obstacle to me talking than it should be, mm -hmm. right? Where it's like, if I'm in person, it's like, you can just sort of say something, but it's like <laughs> the act of unmuting myself is like a sort of a, seems like, it's like, ah, is it really worth unmuting myself to say the, like to say what I'm saying and then un, like remuting myself? Maybe just leave it unmuted, like. Yay. <laughs> Perhaps we can thank the, the mute button for silences, you know, which <laughs> showed to be so rich for everyone. So. I find there's a there's a magic to these collective presencing and intelligence spaces in that with this grid of people and faces, the diversity on screen and the different viewpoints that are raised, I can feel parts of myself talking to myself. So if someone says they're anxious, well, it's my own inner anxious self that's showing up as someone else. <laughs> so it's like a mirror and the different people are expressing different parts of myself. I know that sounds quite <laughs> narcissistic and that's not how I meant I need to say it, but it's interesting to see my own voice reflected in other people expressing what might, I might be saying inside my own head. And that, that's the particular magic of this. It's like an internal family systems playing out here with all the different managers and firefighters around. And there's this dialogue going on between everybody inside. I think I have to take off in a moment, but uh, one thing I, uh, what's kind of coming to mind is, uh, you know, there's different things that we might pay attention to or not pay attention to. And uh, this is like uh, Ravicki's uh, relevance realization, you know, uh, depending on your personality, your, your, you know, your upbringing or whatever, you might tend to pay attention to certain things, different things. Uh, for, for me, I, I tend to pay much more attention to uh, non-human things. I'm in my head a lot, you know, and I have to actually get into a, a less common uh, state of uh, mo uh, presencing where I can, you know, if I have everybody on the grid here and I can, I actually uh, focus on, you know, the interpersonal relations. And that's how, otherwise I'm pretty much, I'm often just like a, a head on a stick as some people would uh would say like you know uh uh so that that helps me get into that sort of presence and otherwise i'd probably come off as pretty distant some people i, I imagine it's a much much more natural thing that you would be uh presencing with people but again uh 
as uh, I can't remember who mentioned a moment ago, with uh, you know actually being able to look into people's eyes directly, uh, that allows us to more uh, naturally relate to each other. But we can do pretty well through the magic of technology. I was, um, when the word, someone mentioned the word steward, uh, and I've been, because it's been stuck in my head, um, and uh, as you probably know, I call myself the steward of the stoa, and I just randomly picked that word, and then I kind of looked up uh, where it's from, um, it's from the mid, uh, Middle Ages, uh, it's like a job description, uh, someone who looks after a household that he doesn't own. Um, so it's like taking responsibility for something that he doesn't own. Uh, and I, I like that, that contrast. It's like full responsibility and you don't own it. That, that seems like the right move to like steward the collective intelligence. Like we don't own it, but we're responsible for it. And there's like a different move like co-stewardship, because there's not just one steward here, like we're all kind of stewards that are anxious in our ability to be responsible for the, the collective intelligence here. And what are the like sort of components or ingredients of co-stewardship? And the one that's just like <clears throat> coming up is trust. Is trusting each person's capacity uh, to steward this, what is already here. I'm imagining our, our space, our, our womb, as a, a place where we have all come to, to bring our offerings and our gifts and sort of set them in the middle, our, our presence, if you will, to play on the word. We're giving our time and our attention right now in the middle. And as we like wind down, maybe we just need to make it uh, explicit that if you need to take, <laughs> And I need to take from this that, that this is the time to take as well. Things have been brought to the middle. What do you need to take? You have permission. And Gracie just jumped back in as I said that. Take the grace if you need it. So Zach, when you use the word womb, I felt a little surge of excitement saying to myself, okay, Rebecca first used that word. I worked with that within my own self after Rebecca used it. Now Zach's speaking that word, the word womb. So this is part of our emerging collective intelligence. A, a language that each person kind of contributes to. And now I'm thinking that can be divisive too. You know, it can be cohering, but now I'm going off on, okay, one group uses these terms, the other group uses those terms. And so now I'm having a different train of thought here. Um, a particular dynamic keeps coming up as part of this for me, which is 
we can be uncomfortable with the silence or not know what we're supposed to do or what is it and it's all mysterious and it can be a wound but it's also this is like another way to feel it which is that it's allowing landing whatever I have just felt whatever you have just felt and contributed, the three things that just came across. So it's kind of like I'm opening up. That silence allows me to open up and let it land. Which means I have to not just be paying attention to what's out there but that the landing is paying attention with what, what gets activated and or resolved and or mixed and landed and take, taken there, Zach, right? You know, if it lands in me, then I take it with me. Yeah. What lands with me really strongly is what um, Zach said was trust. I'm feeling that really strongly and just uh, reveling in it. <laughs> I, I, I want to bring a, a couple of threads together because I guess we're getting to the close of this session. So talking about stewardship and leadership, uh, I mean, it's so useful and so important. But uh, the other day I had a conversation with one of my sort of fellow adventurers. We, we go on big trips and uh, he was saying a, a trip on a northern river is always, or any river anywhere in the world is always more exhilarating and rewarding when it's self-planned if you just hire a, a, a guide uh, you don't have to think about what you're doing you just put yourself in someone else's hand hands but when you do it yourself you you have to think things through you're far more engaged you have to trust each other you have to listen to each other and it's uh, a lot a lot more rewarding and and i th think in a, in a situation like this we're going on a collective journey and we don't know where and we're all having to do the planning and and so consequently it's it's um uh it's more meaningful the um the one hitch I find with sense making in general is that there's an over reliance on an over reliance on words <clears throat> and very often fancy words and big concepts. So every now and again, I I listen in and participate in uh, sessions on the store and elsewhere, and it's just like these big ideas, like one after the other, and and um, and I just. I, I just feel like an I feel like I'm an observer, and and, and it, it 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 makes one feel quite inadequate in in a sense. Except that I'm so arrogant, I don't feel inadequate. But um, you you feel as though you need to go away and study the matter and read the person's uh, ideas in order to actually get anything from it. And and I just wish there were more opportunities like this where everyone comes in equal and no, there's no one here presenting themselves as an expert. And so we can make progress together. And I think that is a message that is so profound and we need to take it uh, and practice it elsewhere in our lives.
Tomo, I'm just wondering, because it's the second time that you mentioned practicing it, practicing it elsewhere. Do you have an idea like where and how? Because um, it is hard in real life to find people who are interested in becoming ninjas, as was mentioned by someone earlier. So I'm just wondering if you have any practical ideas of actually implementing that. Toronto, just one word. Well, the, the biggest Jedi trick is like collective intelligence is everywhere. So it's like that's that's the real black belt of like everywhere you go, it's like you can listen. And then it's also nice to have your own dojo where certain things are done in certain ways. <laughs> yeah. And I'll put in a nice dojo in the comments. Thanks, Peter, for inviting me on. It's good to be here with you and your creation and with everyone else here. Uh, um, yeah, I've I've, uh, I've benefited from the collective intelligence tonight. Yeah, thank you, uh, my friend, for um, coming to the store today. Uh, that was uh, deeply nourishing for me, and I sense for many others. Um, so uh, do check out uh, John over at Circling Europe. Um, and you might be visiting us again at the Stoa next month. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, our next event uh, is going to be uh, with Robert Gilman, Cultural Clovolver, uh, Clo uh, Framework, Skill Sets and Strategy for Embodied Action. He's a really interesting thinker. And then the next Patreon event is um, the 30 year anniversary of King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. Uh, one of the co-authors are coming in uh, to that one at the store, which is going to be exciting. Um, and we might have more general, more events like this at the store as well. Uh, so that being said, John, everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming to the store today. Okay. Thank you all. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.